Mm. Yay, roll back. Mm. I'm a little out of breath. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the learning space this week. Uh, my name is Nicole Galucci. I'm your co-host uh, for this week. Sorry, we're starting a little late. Uh, George and I had a group meeting, Cosmogos group meeting, just before this, which we realized is cutting it way too close. <laughs> so, oh, all the meeting. Mm. So, uh, my co-host, Georgia, through the wall. Yes. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, as usual, you guys can uh, please share and tweet the link, uh, send it to your friends. Um, you can comment using the Q&A app, so anywhere you're watching this, if you click the little pop-up on the bottom left, I guess it's over here for you, um, it'll say, join the conversation with the Q&A app. So go ahead over there, we can see those comments. Um, comments on the event page and YouTube page I will probably not get to in time during the broadcast. Uh, we have hellos already from Nancy Graziano. She says, happy hump day. <laughs> also, uh, hashtag wellness Wednesday. There will be a fitness-related CosmoQuest tweet later today if it hasn't already posted. So I hope that amuses you guys. Uh, and uh, we have a hi from Guido, who's trying to work watch on his tablet, and it's not working yet, so hopefully he gets that working. Hi, Guido. Hi, in Germany. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty much it for the starting announcements. Um, we are going... Oh, and Michael Jobin, hi. You typed a period. And <laughs> Michael Jobin says dot. Very <laughs> thank, thank you. Hello. <laughs> uh, so we are joined by our two guests today, Connie Walker and Scott Carnell. So hello. Hi. Hey, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to be talking about uh, some Dark Skies topics, which is, of course, why I had to tweet a picture of Darth Vader with the announcement of this show. <laughs> you can join us on the dark side. <laughs> God, we have telescopes. Um, dark is good. It can dark, be good. Dark is good. Yes, dark is good. Uh, so first, uh, let's get introductions from Connie and then and then Scott. Tell us a little bit who you are and how you work with the dark skies. Sure. Um, my name is Connie Walker, and I'm at the National Optical Astronomy Observatory. Big, long title. <laughs> and that's our National Observatory here in Tucson, Arizona. And I've been here for about 14 years uh, as an astronomer. However, in the last few years, I've been very incredibly engaged with education and with the uh, preservation of dark skies. And so you could say, in effect, I've turned to the dark side. And um, I've been loving it ever since. And it started out with Globe at Night, and it's grown ever since. And we're going to talk a little bit about Globe at Night today. Yeah, hi. So I'm Scott Cardell from the International Dark Sky Association, and um, that's our business. We're a nonprofit dedicated towards fighting light pollution and trying to do something so that you all can see more stars. Uh, I have an astronomy background and a, and a former life. I was a high school science teacher as well. And um, so all things astronomy and dark skies and light pollution are, are things that interest me, and we're going to talk about some of those today. Awesome, awesome. Um, maybe we'd like to start for new viewers who aren't familiar with the concept of why. <laughs> I mean, it may be kind of obvious, but why do we care about dark skies as astronomers? Well, if I could bring your attention to the first picture under the pretty pictures, um, I could probably try to screen share if you'd like. Yeah. Pretty photos. Tree? Yeah, the, yeah, the first one of the tree. Yeah. Um, I, I love this picture. This is one of the winners from last year's Earth and Sky photo contest that we hold um, every year. And the, the winners are just about ready to be announced. I was hoping we could announce them today. You would have been the first to know. But um, it's almost ready. Um, and here's one of the first place winners, I believe, from last year. It was really significant in the sense that it pulls you in. And it's just this gorgeous image that I don't know if um, too many people get to see. Uh, um, IDA says that about almost three quarters of the world's population you know, living in cities have never seen a pristinely dark night sky. So there's something from at least you know a, a pleasurable viewing kind of thing that we're losing that light pollution in effect is washing out in the night sky. And so that is one, only one reason, but it's a huge reason for um, many people because it, it actually does sort of destroy part of who we are, our culture, and everything that's gone into influencing our culture um, beyond, say, 100 years ago. So you had 
beautiful things that were created, like uh, Holtz the Planets, or Shakespeare's sonnets that have to do with astronomy, or Van Gogh's beautiful um, painting of Starry Night. I mean, there's just so many things beyond astronomy that it influences. And I think a little later on in the talk, we'll also get into other things that it influences as well. But for now, just, just look at this picture and imagine, have you ever seen something so gorgeous? Um, in your lifetime, and isn't it something that you don't want your future, you know, the, the future generations to be missing? So how can we go about trying to preserve that? What is it we can do to make more people who are not necessarily in the position to see such a gorgeous image, um, how can they become more aware? How can you convince them that there's a problem? And so that's where Globe at Night began. Um, uh, Globe at Night is almost 10 years old. Next year we'll do something to celebrate this year. I'm sure in conjunction with the International Dark Sky Association. And, um, and so, but this year is its ninth year and we have for the first time this year been able to offer Globe at Night every single month for 10 days every month. And it's usually this year pretty much the last 10 days of the month. So we're actually in our third day um, or third night tonight of Globe at Night, and you'll have another week or so to participate if you so desire. And um, it basically just allows you to go outside at night, look up at Leo, which is directly above you, say, between 8 and 10 p.m. locally, and take a, a with a visually take a measurement basically just by looking at what you can see towards Leo, which is the faintest set of stars you can see. And we're not asking you to count necessarily, just uh, compare what you see with seven different pictures that we have on our website that, you know, when Nicole says it's okay, we can show you that website. Sure. But, yeah, you want to see it now? Yeah, yeah. I can look that up and you can tell me where to go. Um, well, globeatnight.org is the website. So just as it sounds, globeatnight.org. And on the front page there, let me see if you have it up. Yeah, so, so on the front page there, you can see that we show Leo. <clears throat> and uh, if you want, we also show things like the web app that you can use. So you can click on that link. We also have um, a couple other links I can talk about in a couple seconds that also allow you to measure in different ways, but the same, you're measuring close light pollution. But just for the visual stuff now, we can go to maybe where it says, where the picture is, it says just follow these five simple steps. You can click on that, and it shows you. Oh, I went to the web app. Oh, did you? Oh, well, you can go there too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, for those of you, uh, so there will be some people listening to the podcast version later if you want to play along at home. Uh, globeatnight.org is the website we're on, and I clicked the Submit Your Data link right under Globe at Night Web App, mm -hmm. and that took me right to the web app with the five steps. Yeah, so one of, the, one of the things I like about this, Connie, if I can just interject, is this is so easy. We're talking already. <laughs> uh, um, it, it, it's just been really nice to be able to tell people, oh, you can go and contribute, you know, measurements of the night sky brightness. Mm -hmm. And on the surface, they think, oh, that sounds really hard. What do I do? Do I need equipment? Do I have to do all this special stuff? And it's like, no, it's all right there on the website. It's just really easy. It, you can find where you're at, and, and it helps you with the sky. And, and I recommend it for everybody, really. Mm -hmm. it, it helps us out, and, and you guys have done a great job getting it together. Do you want to lead them through the app um, there? I've done too much talking. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Go for it, Scott. Oh me? Oh gosh. <laughs> well, you know, you've got on the on the left side of the screen there, you've got your your uh, basically your Google Maps, so you can allow it to help you figure out where you're at, or you can put in coordinates if you know those, or you can just start zooming in and you know scrolling around on the map if that's fun. But make sure you get your your location pinned down. Um, you've got. Um, Oh, I yeah, it right. I'm, I'm glad you just did that because you can you can put it in in red sky. Red that sounds like something. A movie. Like a song. Red sky mode. <laughs> That's uh, a movie. A band. Yeah. Um, red light. Yeah. So as to to not hamper your your night vision, so that when you're looking at the the charts for Leo, 
you've got uh, the big one there and then the, all of the smaller ones so that you can choose which one better matches your, your view. Of course, you want to go out and make sure that you're reasonably dark adapted. You don't want to just step outside and go, I don't see any stars, and then turn around and do <laughs> your observation. So you have, you have to give yourself a chance to, to get used to the nighttime environment. Um, but, but once once you've got your location and you um, match what you see in the sky versus the charts that are there, choose the right one, and then choose your, your sky conditions. Are you completely clear? Are you partly cloudy? There's some nice little like cartoon drawings to match the sky. So that's the most adorable a... cartoon clouds I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I just to point that they out. didn't have faces on them, but otherwise they're, they're really good. <laughs> <laughs> and notice where the charts are. You might want to point out where the charts are and, ch and change one or two so they can show. Oh, right. So, um, yeah, click on one. If <laughs> so, when I was a kid growing up in New York, this is probably what I saw. <laughs> yeah, this is unfortunate. You can go through um, the different viewing conditions, the different amounts of stars you can see. Man, if you can see that, that's pretty good. If you're at a really good site, you may be seeing. If you, yeah, I don't know who has eyes like that. <laughs> but you have to remember, as, as Connie said before, yeah. everybody had a star, a night sky like what you just had when you clicked over to the right. Yeah. And that was that's Amazing. part of, of what all of humanity had for all of history. And as she said, it inspires art and religion and science and culture and and and, and uh, all all kinds of cool things that so many of us are cut off from now. And so we want to get to where we're over on the right. And helping us all to get back there is understanding the magnitude of the problem, and that's what makes Globe at Night so cool and so important. Please tell me that was a pun. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, the magnitude, yeah. Well, for the astronomically inclined, yes, that was a pun. Well, also I want to mention that at the top of steps one and two, if you have a smart device of any type, it could be the iPad, it could be your cell phone, any cell phone that's a smart device, it'll automatically put in your date and time and location. Yeah, which is cool. Okay, so and, I'm, and I'm sitting at my uh, computer in my office, so I had to manually put in the position, <laughs> but I know how to find my Skylab very easily in Google Maps because I'm there twice a month. Yeah, when I, when I do this, I like to, to take my iPad outside with me and do the observations that way, mm -hmm. and it gets the date and the time and the location for me, which is just super easy. Um, super easy is good, right, because we want people to go out and, and, and do this stuff. And now there are even other apps, like you can use an app for an Android phone or an iPhone that gets data too, and, uh, and those are fun. Right, so, so, the main, um, so once you've gotten your main parameters down, the time and date, get the weather, um, you're not even counting stars, like you said, you're just picking which of these maps more closely resembles what you're seeing in the night sky. Right, and and if you can notice the fainter stars, sometimes that helps. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you see a faint star in the picture that's in the sky, or vice versa, that's the kind of thing you might want to choose. The chart you might want to choose. Yeah. Right? And you might, if you go to the chart that has more stars in it, the one to the right, and you don't see all those stars, and you know that the star, the chart you had been on is probably the correct one. Yeah, I would so. say last night uh, I was between three or three and four. Um, I, I'm not looking at the sky; I can't visually uh, <laughs> do it now. But uh, that's probably what I would have given it. Um, another good way to find Leo. Uh, can I talk mm, about this just, like a, just a second? You um, had it there, actually. <laughs> what's that? You had it there. You had Mars and Jupiter. It's right in between. Oh, right. right. right now it's conveniently Mars located Jupiter. between two planets. It's right between two planets, but um, <laughs> we talk about um, Stellarium a lot because it's a free planetarium software, so you can download that for pretty much any operating system you're on um, and use that to help you find your way around the night sky as well. So this is what the night sky looks like in my view of Stellarium for 9 o'clock tonight. Yeah, about 9 uh, 9.20 tonight. Um, and there's you, Mars. Where's Jupiter? There's Mars. Jupiter's just off screen. There's Jupiter. Right there. Okay. Good. <laughs> so, of course, you do not have lines in the sky, but I like to put the lines on the chart because it, it really... Well, if it's really dark, you can almost see the lines. <laughs> <laughs> All right, not, not, not really. You can use a green laser pointer and wave it back and forth really fast. Um, yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> Imagination. Want to show them the distinctive feature in Leo, perhaps, for those who might not know? I don't know. I don't know if. I, oh, you mean the sick, the sickle? The sickle. Uh, backwards question mark. Right. Backwards question mark. Right. That's what I. Yeah. So it, it's this the head, and down to like the front paw. So that's the bright star. Regulus. Right. Yeah. Um, did I pronounce that right? Regulus. 
Are you Maybe. A backwards question mark. If you're looking yeah, at not so many people know a sickle as much, maybe as <laughs> right, right. backwards question mark is good. Let's get some backwards because you know communism is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I used the to hammer and sickle used to be a bit much bigger. That uh, I worked at McCormick Observatory, which McCormick oh. farming equipment. So sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's my tie-in. Oh, you know, yeah. Yeah, since since the fall of the Berlin Wall, the whole uh, Leo thing has really been having problems. <laughs> we'll go with backwards question mark. People people are pretty pretty keen on that. Um, it's not. I mean, it, they're it, they're definitely not. I mean, except for Regulus, they're not the brightest stars in the sky. So it may take you a minute to, to kind of find that. Uh, it's not like the Dipper, um, but it yeah. is. Uh, it is now, but like Scott it. said, it's it's amazing. Once you do see it, once you see that, just that pattern of that backwards question mark, it just it will leap out at you mm -hmm. every time. I mean, it almost is like I can see the lines, but you the, you can see the pattern and and it stays with you. So, in the northern hemisphere, um, Leo Leo's sort of back end <laughs> will be like a little triangle to the left, typically of. Uh, or derriere, what do you want to say? <laughs> haunches? How about haunches? And there, you know, for telescope observers, there's some nice galaxies in in the the back end there. Uh, there's a, a nice if you've got a good wide field telescope, you can see like three galaxies in in one field of view. It's really pretty cool. Oh wow! Oh, and yeah. you know, this week too, starting let's see, in two nights, the, the night of the 23rd to 24th, there's that there's that new meteor shower. So I, I would say that kill two birds with one stone and go outside and take some up at night data and enjoy that meteor shower at the same time. So and if you, could, you also need dark skies for right? Dark for enjoyment yeah, of meteor showers. I don't know how dark my skies are going to be. <laughs> like meteor storm, and I'm going to not see it. Gosh, if we, if we have any listeners in California or viewers in California, I'm going to be at the Starlight Festival in Big Bear, oh, California this jealous. week. Jealous. Yeah. yeah. We'll have, uh, well, the meteor shower, but they're doing events for kids, and there'll be bubbles and concerts and robots and, and observing the sun in the day and the stars in the night, and it's going to be a cool astronomy event happening. Thing. Can I mention where it is again, Scott? Big Bear, California, this weekend, Memorial Day weekend. At the yeah. Is it at the observatory or in the city there? Uh, they're going to have tours of the Solar Observatory, but it's in town uh, for everybody to come and enjoy the event. So that's a cool thing. And cool. it's free. So yeah. even better. So uh, we have comments from Guido, who uh, is probably approaching evening. I can't see that. Because Guido's in Germany. Uh, oh, yeah. I can't wait for the first really clear, warm nights around here. Despite being in the middle of a big city, he gets incredibly starry nights to see. So we hope to see some Germany observations from you, Guido. Huh? Huh? <laughs> so what well, is clear? On, on that topic, if I could show you one map that uh, Guido might uh, appreciate. Let me see if I can find um, uh, Globe at Night Maps. Uh, it's under Globe at Night Maps, um, Nicole, and it's the Leibniz and Berlin um, map. Oh. If you want to that one. It is a beautiful map, and then I can tell you a little bit more about that particular group that was involved in taking this. Do you see that, or do you uh, want me? To I just see the full. I just I clicked maps. Mm -hmm. Did you get the folder? What was in the folder? Oh, oh, that folder. I'm looking on the website. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here no. we go, Berlin. Yeah, look at that. I can. I, I would assume it's a little bit under. I think 200 kilometers between Berlin and Leibniz. And you can oh my see, gosh. I know, I know. They, oh, and they took, all observations along that. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Oh wow! They took, <laughs> they took they took sky quality meter measurements actually, and I'll show you what that is in a second. Yeah. Um, and this group that took it is also involved um, in um, something called uh, loss of the night app. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. That that's another way to take a little bit night measurements, and um, and what they've done is they basically made a program that's almost like a star walk. So what you point it up to the sky and anywhere you look is, is what, this, what the constellations are up. So it's a very nice app and it works right now only on Android phones, but they're trying to make one in the future for iPhones as well. <laughs> and yeah, no kidding. I'm, I'm excited about that because that's what I, <laughs> that's what oh, I, I use. I'm an Android. I'm, a, I'm like a... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so, that's um, Christopher Kiba. Yeah, it's Kiba. Kiba. That project. So, um, let me sh maybe we could show that from the homepage. So the web app is one way to do it. Um, you use that in a browser on a tablet or laptop if you're outside, 
or do the observations when you get back in if you can remember really quickly. Um, <clears throat> the other ways, so you you can use these mobile apps as whoops <laughs> as well. Sorry, I'm pushing the wrong buttons. There we go. It's the front um, page you can get it from our front page. So if you go scroll down to the bottom there, it, it'll sh show you the loss of the night um, link as well as another one we'll talk about Dark Sky Meter app. But you can see, um, yeah, you can go there. There you go. Yep. And yeah, it, it takes you star by star and says, can you see this? Can you see this? Can you see this? Can you see this? And I think it, the, the minimum is like five stars, but I'll sit there and do it for like 20 stars. <laughs> Just, you know, I'm learning the stars while I'm doing it. Learning star names while I'm doing that. So that's for Android devices. And again, because you're on a mobile device, it gives you the um, it gets your location and time automatically. So you have many ways to, well, I don't want to say, well, to skin a cat, but yeah, you have many ways to do this. Um, I am, <laughs> I'm a cat lover, so I shouldn't have said that. But yeah, all right. <laughs> Who's collecting the data? Um, Connie, maybe you can talk, because it's, it's actually a citizen science project, right? And um, so you're not only out there becoming aware of the importance of dark skies, but you're collecting data that's yeah. going to help with all of that. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Oh, my goodness. Um, we have, um, yes, we, we are collecting, we have over 110,000 data points right now from the, the various years, and they're, they're vetted very good data points, and we thank the whole public because there's power in number. We can't do this alone. I mean, I just would not be able to go out and take all this data, and we really do need to monitor our night skies and see if they are getting worse, and if they are, to take the appropriate action. So, you know, trying to convince people to shield their, their lights and stuff like that, and I hope a little later on that... that um, that Scott can tell us about how to do that. Um, but right now we're on the verge and I have I have some exciting programs that I can't quite divulge everything about but there's three huge things on the horizon and and they're all involving globe at night data and um, one is basically uh, with data with birds that were they've already started and uh, it's, it's sort of being tested. Another is to make a contiguous map across the U.S. of light pollution and there's knowledge of how to do that already by this particular organization. They've done it for something else, very vetted it very well, so they really feel that with the globe at night data this can be done as well. So you'll have data that you can draw on anywhere in the U.S. We're going to extend that in the future, but right now it's we're going to test it with the U.S. And then we'd layer it with other data, for, for instance, from the, from the data from the birds, all this bird data that's out there that a particular organization has <laughs> and um, and then on top of that to to allow the public to do the analysis what's really cool is that there's a third organization that is uh, providing tools with which they online that they can do the analysis so we're gonna I'm hoping I'm trying to get these three different groups together um, we've succeeded with two groups and now we're gonna work on the third and I'll be testing the um, online and data, data tools uh, in the next couple of months I think and we'll see if that works because that you know you take layers of data it could be population data it could be bird data it could be um, you know it, obviously globe at night data and it'll be really cool to be able to make projects out of this um, very much like projects can I show you one example it's so sure. I am so proud of our poster children I like to call them <laughs> Because they have, um, and, and you can see this, Nicole, under uh, the directory that says Poster Children. If you go there. It's actually the directory Poster Children. I <laughs> know. <laughs> and if you go under Thai Fam Swans uh, JPEG there, this little young boy has made me so proud, and I had nothing to do with this except just to lend him an SQM. Um, um, I don't know if you have that up yet, but uh, yeah. Oh, and he, we've gotten permission to show him, oh, so it's cool. okay. Uh, yeah, so he got uh, he won the uh, na the science um, and engineering uh, regional. It's a regional fair for the whole south the southern part of the uh, of Arizona. Uh, he won for the for the his uh, age category, which he's in fifth grade, the first prize for his ingenuity and his uh, really really good project that did look at uh, different variety of night birds and see if light pollution had an effect on them, which he found it did. So they preferred preferentially to be elsewhere other than where it's, um, you know, mm. well lit. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's things like these that this is the other category I wanted to mention that it's, it's not just us looking up at the night sky, but light pollution affects so many other things in our lives that are pertinent to our lives. 
So one of these other areas is the is the night the wildlife at night. Mm -hmm. So um, I you know and and a lot of those have been the migratory habits of birds, for instance. Um, but one thing I'm sure Scott can speak to right now is how it affects turtles. Can you do that, Scott? You oh that? yeah. So sea turtles aren't really a big thing here in Tucson, Arizona, where I am now, but. Uh, they are in many places, and sea turtles are perhaps the species that is most impacted by light pollution. And, you know, they, they live the vast majority of their lives in, in the ocean, doing their thing in the ocean, but the mother turtles come on to dark sandy beaches to lay their eggs. And so they're sort of spooked away by bright light, but more important than that, is when baby sea turtles hatch out, they have one mission in their early life, and that's to find the ocean. If they, if they can make it to the ocean, they have a chance of, of living and growing and thriving and surviving. But if they don't, they die. And there's a, a really sh limited period of time in which they can do that. Uh, unfortunately, nature has programmed them in, in such a way through evolution to look for the contrast between the sky and the horizon of the ocean to, to key mm -hmm. in on that. And outdoor lighting totally messes that up. Mm. So if there's lighting near the beach, they go to the lights instead of the ocean. And, and that's, the, that's the crux of the problem. Wow. And what we've learned over time is that light that's low to the ground, light that's long in wavelength, like a redder, sort of an orange kind of color, and light that's low intensity has much less impact on the sea turtles. And one of the things that we did in IDA last year was uh, uh, we were storming the beaches in Florida, uh, literally going across the whole Florida panhandle, surveying the lighting in places to find what was good, what was bad, what was a problem, both daytime and nighttime surveys, and then making recommendations on how do you fix this. And uh, we're excited that that work on how do you fix this is, is coming soon, and then we're going to go back and reassess and see how well it, it really, ha really went. But... More than any other species, sea turtle, baby sea turtles are, are really strongly affected by light at night, and all species of sea turtles are currently threatened or endangered. And so the rise of artificial lighting has, has been a huge problem population-wise for, for their survival. And, and there's a lot that's happening to try to raise that awareness and, and, and create some action to help make things better. We have a comment from Legi. Brought this up. We have a comment from Sylvan Westby, um, which is along these lines. Uh, I think dark skies, the dark skies cause of astronomy and culture should be paired with natural preservation uh, and energy saving arguments. To will that have a bigger impact? Okay. Oh, now there's something that, that Scott can, can address very well too. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, you, you know, maybe could we go to some of the pictures? Sure. I, uh, I just also wanted to comment on the sea turtles. I think uh, Finding Nemo is going to be making a sequel, and and the sea turtle character is adorable. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I yeah. see I see I see opportunity. Yes. That's all. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that's a cool idea. So okay. I, I have some pictures that I call like, well what's wrong with this picture? Yeah. And, and uh that don't kind of get us to to some of these issues. And the first one is an overtly astronomy picture. So we'll start with number one. Okay. All right. So what's wrong with that picture? Uh plenty. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll let our esteemed panel decide what they think. <clears throat> okay, for what it's worth, I have staged pictures like this specifically for press releases. This is not a staged picture. Oh, it's not? <laughs> <laughs> no. What is it? This was at an actual star party for an event to celebrate dark skies. Oh, is my that God. A building in the, so that's a building wall in the background? Yeah, with a bright floodlight. With a bright light covering. reflecting off it. Like, <laughs> wow. Okay, what's I not wrong? Bright light is not good. All right, I think it's pretty obvious that's bad. We've got three telescopes there. It's nighttime. No one's even curious about what they're pointed at because the the lighting here is so terrible. I mean, we have a bright light shining on a white wall right yeah. next to where people are doing trying to do astronomy. That's just goofy. I could uh, see not having access to whoever controls the light, except it looks like it's. Well, maybe that's a telescope that's plugged in. However, there were things like jackets <laughs> that you can throw over the light. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you might get to some fire danger, I suppose, yeah, if the light uh, 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 is non flammable. A, a source of heat. But that's holy true. smokes, nobody's even. Yeah, I mean, 
you could pick up a telescope, drag it away, and you know, not not look at the light and, and try to do something. But they're plugged into the wall, which means they may not have battery packs. Uh, there's therefore there's a, a little Dobsonian in the foreground there too. So uh, <laughs> anyway, we we know that that light at night in astronomy is a problem, and that well, we know we, that. But people who come to our star parties don't always know that. They come with their <laughs> flashlights waving all over the place. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true, and they're going to take flash photography because the view is so cool. Uh, so I, I've, I've seen that kind of thing before. And we want to make sure that as the, the message of light pollution spreads, that we try to reach beyond just amateur astronomy. Right. And for, for people that are interested in amateur astronomy, your opening argument shouldn't be, I want to see more stars. <laughs> it really should be about money and energy and the environment and even human health and, and good visibility. Uh, there are all kinds of reasons to want to do the right thing for stopping light pollution that will make astronomy better. But you don't necessarily have to lead for astronomy because some people just, you know, we, we saw that great picture that, that Connie gave us with the tree and the Milky Way and it was, it was beautiful. And, it, and if you're tuned to, to the universe and tuned to, to that kind of thing, you get that. But there are some people that aren't and never will be. You know, the same kind of person you might say, oh, look at this fabulous sunset, and they go, yeah, sun goes down every day. You know, they're not interested. Um, but, but I think people that, that understand that understand the importance of, of seeing a good sky. But not everybody's going to be there. So we have to help them in ways. So, all right, let, let's, let me just do another picture, number two. What's, what's wrong with the picture for number two? Uh, if we can find it. Screen sharing. There, there. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a All right, if you, if you can't tell, that's a stop sign. <laughs> angle's a little bad. Oh, and, and so the laughter's a good sign. I think Nicole <laughs> didn't do this. And those are floodlights pointed basically at the driver. <laughs> Sorry. So that's really bad. That's really this isn't bad. really an astronomy thing so much as a human safety thing, right? We, I can't we, even. Guys, I can't even. Who did this? <laughs> This is in Florida, by the way. I, I, I won't tell you where. But, but there's a case where uh, safety is clearly threatened. You have two bright, glary, shining lights pointed at a driver that's coming to a stop sign. That makes no sense whatsoever. I don't understand that at all. Are they always on? They're not just like emergency type lights. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't see that there's any situation where having those on would be a good thing. Yes, it's an emergency. Uh, Let's blind the drivers. Okay. That's exactly what's going to happen. The driver will be so blinded they can't even see anything. They're going to be a stop sign. Oh, my God. I can't. Yeah. This is amazing. And so another factor here is that the light is not pointed down, which is, I think, probably going to be one of the points you make, Scott. Well, right. So, so with it pointed sideways... You have glare for the driver, which is which is bad. It's that safety issue. With regard to to light pollution, uh, pointing the light, you know, that way, nearly at the horizon instead of downward, is is especially bad for night sky brightness. We know that sideways pointing light, that the effect of that lighting propagates over much greater distances, that even than light that points straight up. So sideways light is, is particularly bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, glare is, is never a good thing. And, and we really always advocate lighting in a way that, that shows off what you need to see to be safe, to navigate, and it, it, that isn't wasteful and doesn't impair vision. And this doesn't do any of that. Right. So, if, so you, if you, OK. No, I was going to say, so there's plenty wrong with this picture. <laughs> there it is. It's yeah. hilariously bad. Wow. Nicole, if you want to, if you want to just build on on this uh, in terms of one picture, uh, if you go to the good and bad lighting directory and you look at the first one on fixtures, um, that, that'll bring out more of the kinds of, of um, shielding that Scott is re recommending here. Is it just good lighting? <coughs> look under oh, good and bad lighting and look under and then click on fixtures. Fixtures, good plus bad. Okay. Yeah. Oh, actually, that, that's not the right one. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Can you give me the file name? Yeah, yeah it's, it's the one that just has, doesn't it just says examples of good and bad lighting uh, with no number attached to it. I'm sorry, so it's probably the last one in your directory. There. Oh yeah, this one I, I tweeted this one. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Even from Cosmo Quest, because I loved it so much. Uh, yeah, and it's the perfect size for Twitter images. Oh, yeah. Good job, guys. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, um, Scott. Well, like. I mean, uh, the the gosh, the graphics says it better than, than I'm going to say, right? <laughs> and and, and we, we see examples of, of that bad one all over the place. People love these things that are called acorn lights or globe lights where the light just goes everywhere. And you can see how small a percentage of that light is that comes out is actually useful light. Like if you want to see what's on the ground so you can walk around, this light isn't doing that. It's putting some there, but it's also putting some right into your eyes. It's putting lots into the sky, and uh, you know maybe 30% down on the ground where it belongs. So if that's true, then 70% of that is wasted light. Yeah. And what's going... really ironic is you know the first picture, the worst. You can't. You really can't see little Yosemite Sam there. You can't see him any better or really worse than you can't see Yosemite Sam stalking you. Because there's too much glare, so it, again, it's it's just wrong in every way. Right. I'm almost tempted to go down the hallway and get Pamela to do a rant on the second type of lighting, because they replaced all the good lighting on her street with the second type, because it was historical, and I'm doing air quotes that you can't see. Yeah. <laughs> and it's fun to watch her rant about that. If you want to see a really good example of this, uh, I think I might have got this picture from IDA. I look at uh, 3A and then 3B on that same in the same directory there. Hang on, my cursor disappeared. Okay, 3, 3B. Whee! 3A is huh? that. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, God, there's a guy there. <laughs> well, you can barely see him, right? Oh, and, then, and then if you go to 3B... And basically shield the light. There's a guy there. <laughs> wow. So that's that's the cool thing about that one. Um, and uh, that's for all and, the people who talk about light, lighting and safety concerns. I mean, right here, can't yeah. see dude, can see dude. Absolutely. Right. And more light doesn't make you more safe. Yeah. Right. Better light can can do a far better job in terms of illuminating what you might be worried about, what you might want to be noticing and seeing. Yeah. But it's it's not a situation as is most things like if if this much makes you safe, this much will make you that much more. No, it doesn't work that way, right? It doesn't so um, more doesn't necessarily mean better. Right. And, and it's certainly true when it's uncontrolled light, like in the the first example. Yeah. And if you go to seven A and B, uh, this is an example of what you can do. And I know IDA is doing a lot more with sports lighting now. Yeah. So I'm not sure if you were involved with this. I think uh, someone else might have been, but um, so it's a it's a it's a stadium in Tucson, and oh, yeah, and the, yeah mm -hmm. and the first one they they those lights were replaced by the second picture you'll see, and that makes such wow. a difference. Wow. Yeah. And and so this was taken from a nearby mountain, oh. and in the in the in the before picture you notice there's glare. That's yeah. gone in, this, in the second picture. So that's light from the that's supposed to go on a football field, right? That, that's shining that way up up into the mountain, and that's just a tremendous waste. And in the the after picture, those those lights are brighter. They they did this not just for energy efficiency and for dark skies, but they did this because they wanted more light down on the football field. Wow. And of course, if you put the light where you want it. Instead of up in the sky and up in the mountains, then you're doing a better job. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. Yeah, we had um, the uh, football stadium was uh, at University of Virginia was often a um, we would have to there was always one night game and we'd always have to cancel all our astronomy labs mm -hmm. <laughs> for the one night game. Um, but they had to they used to leave the lights on on the field all the time and we had to lobby them to stop doing that. If no one's on the field, stop. <laughs> <laughs> we can't do astronomy. Um, <laughs> You know, I, th I think that used to be very, very, very common, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's much less so now because people realize, oh, you know, it does cost money to keep those lights on at night, mm -hmm. and it does have a, an impact on the neighborhood, whether it's astronomy or people just trying to sleep. Yeah. Uh, that bright light at night can, can definitely be a problem. Uh, so I have, uh, I have a couple of others what, of what's wrong with this picture, if we want to... Sure. Yeah. So. <laughs> i got to show this one. Sorry, I'll try not to laugh too hard. 
Oh, no, you should laugh. You should laugh. <laughs> There's nothing about this that makes any sense. <laughs> Other than that, it's great. Well, I have to say it too. It is on an observatory dome, I think. <laughs> yeah. Really? <laughs> I know where that is or where well, it was. We, I think uh, it's been since fixed, but we won't yeah. name names, right? Okay. Um, so. The light. Yeah. All too often, people are told, "Oh, it's dark there." It's not safe. Put up a light. And so if you imagine yourself walking toward that light, when you're far from it, you have this bright light shining right at you. So you're getting glare. You know, it's it's making your pupils get small and making it hard for you to see. And then as you approach the step and the door, you are plunged into total darkness because yeah, you know that roof is is blocking the light. And and so there's nothing about that that's safe in any way. Uh, or that makes sense. But far too often, people don't really think through the implications of, of, well, what is this light supposed to do? How bright does it need to be? Where should it shine? Where should we hang it? A and uh, they just put up a light. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's like, I don't know, buying a new car because it's blue and you like blue, but you didn't test drive it and you don't know the mileage and you don't know anything else about it. Uh, but, oh, yeah, we just put a light up there because we needed a light. <laughs> yeah. So, there's some examples that are just kind of wacky. We have a couple comments. I like the one from Guido. Uh, it says, floodlights pointing away. I think he meant to say floodlights pointing away from stop sign. Lawsuit waiting to happen. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and I don't know if, if uh, Guido knows, but we have uh, some new dark sky places in Germany, Ooh. including yeah. one that's only a little more than an hour from Berlin. Uh, so if he, in that area, West Havilland Nature Park, uh, I've been there. It's beautiful. So if he gets a chance to go to some of our new dark sky places in Germany, uh, I hope he'll let us know if he enjoys it. And they had that as a tour on our last uh, communicating astronomy with. Well, no, was it that or the Allen meeting? It was the at the Allen meeting. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Andrew Planet. Are there any ideas to switch um, to have movement sensors on public lighting because it would save taxpayers money and it might um, motivate action on the matter? So yeah. on, on little used roads, is there is there a push to get uh, mo motion sensors? There is an idea for highways to have smart lighting so when you're approaching, the motion sensor would detect that and turn the lights on. I'm not sure sure how how widespread that. I don't know if it's even gotten off the ground yet. What do you what do you know about that, Scott? Yeah, it's definitely coming. And the the cool thing is that we're we're in this technological age where we have uh, new lighting that's instant on and off because the old school stuff kind of like takes five minutes to come up to, right. yeah. to speed. It doesn't just like flip a switch and have it happen. And uh, far improved motion controls and computer controls. And, and timers. So if you know you have a road that's going to have low traffic, at, you know, after midnight or something like that, you could have lights that turn off. You could have lights that go to 50% brightness or whatever you think is appropriate mm -hmm. dimming for that area. And then they can sense when there are pedestrians or when there's traffic or something and come up to the value they need to be at and then come back down after they go away. So I've seen some, some demonstrations of this, uh, not in person, but in video. And uh, that movement is really growing in Europe right now. And it's starting to come in the United States. There are some cities here now. Uh, I know of one in California that they decided they're just going to take out, permanently remove one third of their streetlights because they didn't need them. Mm -hmm. And another third of their streetlights at midnight, they, they dim them way down. So there are cities that are, are being proactive. They want to save money. They want to cut down on CO2 emissions for, for global warming. And um, they realize that, you know, what's the message we tell our kids? Oh, when you leave the room, turn off the light. Yeah. Right? That's just the thing. You, like, that's a required thing that moms and dads have to say to their kids. And I yet, to my boyfriend we, all the time. <laughs> he moved in. That's good. Do we do that? Or do, do we turn off the lights in our parking lots, in our yeah. streets at 2 in the morning when nobody's there? Often we don't, and, and we need to do that. One thing that really bothers me is a lot of stores tend to leave their lights on both inside the store when yeah. they're closed and also like big light up signs. Like I get advertising, um, but is there anything uh, along those lines with, with talking with retailers about the light that they're wasting? 
Well, certainly some communities have decided that you just can't do that, that like within an hour of the business being closed, those lights have to be off. And there's a new national law for France saying that oh. businesses have to turn off their light for the whole country uh, mm -hmm. once they're closed. And we have those kinds of regulations in, in Tucson. It doesn't always apply to all advertising, but, but to, uh, to lots of places. And, and you know, if, as you're going around shopping, you might start to see this inside stores. They have lights that will motion detect in, uh, like, the, the freezer section or something. So they'll come on, and you, you notice that there's pizza there or something. Mm -hmm. but, but when they're off, when you're not there, they're off, and they're saving money. So mm -hmm. businesses are starting to realize, you know, because it's all about uh, saving money and maximizing profit, and they're realizing that if they turn off lights, that their profit line looks better. And I think more and more of them are, are going to go and start using this. So that's definitely one way to get involved, is to, to get involved with your city government or your county government um, in, in order to get ordinances passed if they're not already existing in your area. Um, and there's ways to get involved in that. Um, so if you can't do it practically on, on, on the argument of energy, and you can't do it exactly on how, you know, saving money with uh, replacing it with the right kinds of fixtures and bulbs, mm -hmm. then uh, those lawsuits, like Georgia was saying, <laughs> might do the trick in saving money that way. <laughs> but well, there's just guys, What's that? Oh, sorry, Connie. I was just going to say, you guys have lots of resources, right, and um, information. So if somebody does want to um, start a campaign maybe in their local area, right, and needs information, needs the data to back it up, um, different approaches to use, right, with people that you guys have some resources that might be helpful. Yeah, Dark Skies is a great resource. Do you want to yeah, mention? Darksky.org is, is the International Dark Sky Association. That uh, maybe you yeah. want to talk a little bit about the resources there, Scott. Well, they have pamphlets and they have um, how tos in terms of uh, residential lighting, and um, they have the fixture seal of approval kind of things that you could look at to see what which uh, lights might be good lights for you. And what else would you recommend there, Scott? Well, they should also check out our short video, Losing the Dark which is a great introduction um, to the problems of light pollution and the, the solutions of light pollution, and it's, and it's on YouTube and Vimeo, and you can download it uh, as well. But we try to, to, to bring together all of the, the issues related to light pollution in terms of safety, environment, uh, uh, security, and, and dollars, and, and have those resources there. And if people get to the website and they, they, they're pretty sure there's something on crime and they, they can't find it, you know, they just drop us a note and, and we'll help them find that. Uh, the website is a little bit of a maze and we're, you know, trying to sort that out. Uh, so it's a little easier to navigate for everybody. But we have a lot of resources there on darksky.org. Yeah, that Losing the Dark video is was, was initially made for Planetaria, but we also have this, the flat screen version, um, and it's been translated into, what, 13 languages now? That's right, and we're working on Italian now, too, to add to it. So you got Russian and, and, and Mandarin and, and uh, Korean and Hindi and French and German and Spanish, and, and yeah, we got uh, a lot of choices there. Speaking mm -hmm. of languages, I also wanted to point out, you guys showed me that the Globe at Night uh, web app is available in 26 languages at the moment. Um, so that That's also... Wow. Well, the, the guides are. The, there's uh, yeah. the guides are too. Right, right. The web app's a you know, half a dozen different languages at least. I can't remember oh. how many right now. But uh, yeah, the, or a lot, maybe a lot more than that. But you're right. Yeah, the guides themselves, which are the instructional, um, how to take the measurements, are in 26 different languages with the mag magnitude charts, charts one through seven on them, and a report page if you're if you're not able to be in front of a, a smart device at the moment and have to go back later on and insert the you know submit the observations with your computer. So. What up in Chinese? Oops, you're in the dark. <laughs> what up in Chinese? <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, look. <laughs> I just found it. <coughs> Very cool. Mm -hmm. yeah, there are all the languages that it... Yeah, there you go. Wow. There's the page with all the different kinds of things oh. you can download. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the red is for nighttime. Yeah, I've still got nighttime on. Right. That's my bad. Greek. 
Yeah. All right, I could do this all day. <laughs> Stop me now. Well, you can notice too uh, for the northern and the southern hemispheres there on the page you were on uh, the constellations uh, that they are used at various times of year for globe at night. Yeah, so that's northern. Yeah, that's the other thing to to point out is southern hemisphere viewers have. Uh, other constellations that may, I mean, most of the constellations you pick are, are mid, middle of the sky, <laughs> um, so that they can be seen. I mean, yeah. we try to get ones that are overhead, so you're not going through a lot of atmosphere, right. so you're taking a good measurement of light pollution from zenith point, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. and we have help online as to how to find those constellations, so that we try to make it as easy as possible. And it's, there's a cute little maps like the Stellarium stuff that we have on our website that you put your cursor over the constellation when you've gotten when you've identified it. Right. And it shows you the outline of the constellation, little cartoon figure, so you know you're there. That's so you can practice. And it's fun. There's a lot of fun. There's mm -hmm. myths and all sorts of things on there too. We mentioned the Android app. Uh, Nancy Graziano says, "What about us BlackBerry users?" <laughs> Oh, well, <laughs> well. again, you um, can use the web app that we have on the any side of the Yeah, to insert the visual and if you have a, oops, I'm trying to show this, hey. the sky quality meter here. Yeah. And, and this is um, made by Unihedron. If you, if you want, a, we have a special price with Unihedron. If you want to contact me, we get it for a bit less. Um, and I can I can share that with you when you email me and I can give you the contact information at the end. But if you can't spend... Uh, the money to get one of these, which um, would be, well, I, sh I can tell you, I guess. It's $85 through us, but it's through the company, it's $135. So That's we, a good we, price. Yeah, yeah. So we get, we've bought probably close to a thousand of these over the last uh, eight years or so because we, we have teacher workshops and stuff. But if you can't do that, there is an app mm -hmm. uh, called the Dark Sky Meter app. And that's at darkskymeter.com. You can pick that up. And that's also, on, you know, can be linked. From the front page of Globe at Night. To, yeah. Uh, and, it's really uh, easy, too. The ahead. dark sky meter, that's, that's for the iPhone. There you go. And um, it's, it's super because it, it makes use of the camera on the back of the phone, and you, you put your finger over it, you take a, a measurement of darkness, you know, no light coming into the camera, and then you uh, it'll vibrate and let you know when it's got that, and then it takes a measurement of... Uh, the sky itself, and depending on whether you get the free version or the paid version, uh, how it reports the data to you is a little different. How it reports the data to Globe at Night is is the same. The paid version, you get a, a value in magnitudes per square arc second, and um, it'll also hold all that stuff. So I have a, a whole list of data that I've taken from from my place uh, and wherever I travel around. So I'll do that from Big Bear this weekend at the Starlight Festival. Or, um, I'll be encouraging. I'll be giving out Globe at Night postcards there too, and encouraging people to participate. Yeah, well, you could have a flash mob, like we we've done that before with with uh, oh, yeah, cool. devices and with you know just the regular Globe at Night stuff. Uh, have a flash mob that night if you'd like it, and at your star party and take measurements. That yeah, would be cool. I will. I will try to tell everybody to talk that up. One <laughs> of the things that's that's, that's nice uh, in in crowdsourcing data, right? is if I do something that's a little bit wacky and uh, someone else does too, if there's enough of us, you know, all the data gets to be really better when there's just more and more observations. Mm -hmm. So if I don't really quite know my constellation well and I clicked wrong on the chart, you know, someone else is going to click and kind of offset mine. But the average of all these observations will really be a much better number than any one set mm -hmm. of observations. We have shown that with crater counting, so we totally get that. <laughs> More, so more citizen science observations is a good thing. More the better. Will that app automatically upload the data then to yeah, wherever? We actually yeah. grab the data from both the loss of the night and from the Dark Sky Meter app. It, it downloads automatically to our database, which is really nice. So you don't need to resubmit it with our Globe at Night app. It just does it automatically. Nice. So with our Globe at Night uh, app, the only thing you really need to, to use is the actual um, visual measurement. To, you know, you submit it there. And also if you use an SQM. And actually, um, I can introduce somebody here. Hey, Mark. What about this? <laughs> this is the guy responsible for the website, the, the map app, everything you can imagine. And this is <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. 
Do you have any technical questions for him? <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, we have a BlackBerry user. <laughs> That's right. I think we, we decided our browser is good for that. <laughs> Very cool. Welcome. Um, I want to show the map at the bottom of the page, Globe at Night page, Connie. Sure. Oh, yeah. Do this is really cool. This is what Mark did, actually. You want to explain it? What you did with that map? Um, the bottom of the, fr the front home page? Yeah, we just kind of detect where you're located and then look around that area in a radius of 10 kilometers or something like that and then show all the data that's been collected in that area. See, obviously, I've been slacking because there is one dot in the okay. middle of St. Louis and nothing on our side of the river. Oh. I, should show, I should show you the one for, for our, from our site. We, uh, the Global Night has uh, nearly 800 measurements just this year alone uh, in Tucson. So let me see if I can find that. Okay. Um, so when you go to the Global Night page, it will either hone in on your location or you have to put it in. I don't remember if I put it in already or if it just found me. It might ask you if it can use your location. I think I think that's what it did. Yeah, the mm. first time I came here. Then it just so, asks where let me see at. if I can screen share. I'm really bad at this, but I'll try. There's um, Muscoota. I'm going to be doing a uh, astronomy camp for kids all the way out there in Muscoota. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor. <laughs> it's darker yeah. there. Yay! Wow. They're going to be building Galileo scopes yeah. and uh, an itty bitty radio telescope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's Connie's map. Yeah, yeah. See, Tucson mm -hmm. kicks the pants off of everybody. Yeah, yeah, yep. it's, it's happening in town. It's yeah. really impressive. Uh, yeah, and you can see as you get further away from town, towards toward the north there, the mm -hmm. darker the dot, the darker the sky. The brighter the dot, the brighter the sky. So, I don't know if I believe that one right in the middle of town, but <laughs> as as you know, as Nicole was saying, and and um, the more measure, and and you know, also Scott was saying, the more measurements you have, the more you can tell. And we've actually made. Um, maps, uh, contour maps, like you would have if you're looking down at a regular map and you see mountains and stuff, where the peaks would be uh, um, this pr pretty much the center of town where it's brightest and it goes on down like a topological map um, and gets darker and darker as you go further away from the city. And it's true for Tucson too. We have probably, I don't know, more than 5,000 points for, for Tucson over the years, I would assume. So it's a really nice map. So you guys have been collecting some data um on, let's figure out which ones of these, on which locations are um, giving you the most <coughs> measurements, things like that. Mm -hmm. What is happening? Oh, that one's already open. Um, so Fine. here's a screenshot of that data from this year so far, um, showing where the data is coming from, what type of device, uh, mm -hmm. observations over time, and then the top countries, your US, Croatia, and Poland, so rock on. Uh, and Arizona and South Carolina and Texas are beating the pants off of just about everybody. <laughs> so. Chile's number four. I have to mention Chile. That's our compadres down there. Oh, Chile, of course. There's, there's three cities that do a lot down in Chile. And if you want to go to the, the Globe at Night Maps uh, directory, you can pull out the Chile one. Um, they've, they've really got went, went bananas. Um, it's uh, the one with Santiago and... Um, yeah, Santiago's a bit right. <laughs> Concepcion and Talca, they've done a great job, and we thank them very, very much. I was just trying to look for um, an image. I'll have to pull it up later. Um, Richard Drum found uh, a map, I think it was, of light, of, of light pollution measurements over St. Louis and, like, superimposed it with a Google map or Google image. I'll have to find that later. Oh, really? We have maps of Santiago. Nice. Do you, yeah, do you see that one? Or did you already put it up? I don't know. Uh, here it comes. Yeah. 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 There. If you have, you can see that. So you have uh, Santiago at the very top. Or, no, actually in the... In no, the, it's up at the top. Whoops. Yeah. It's the top. You can't see the word. Right. <laughs> it's a little obliterated, but it's there. Concepcion's down the bottom there, and uh, yeah, yeah, and they're in the middle of a city called Telca. Cool. Mm -hmm. Telca. Santiago's yeah. quite bright, but up mm -hmm. north of that is where you're going to start to get to the, the big professional observatories. That's exactly right. So. Nice. Yeah, so it's nice and dark usually. In Insert obligatory Pisco Sour. <laughs> 
You know, it, um, one thing we may want to, one of the last, um, I guess, let me see if I can plan on, um, maps I'd like to kind of um, show just because it does give you a good visual impact of what's been happening over the years, is the under other LP maps, you'll see the Senzano map there. And if you want, I can screen share that. Um, I'm getting better at this. <laughs> Ooh, nice. I've seen this. Do you, that one or do, you want, do you want to do that? Okay. Yeah. And, and you can see um, they've taken some data from the Defense Meteorological Satellite, and they've... Uh, well, they've done certain things to it, but they've tr they sort of um, went backwards in time and then forwards in time. So most of the data that you see here came from uh, the 1990s and 2000s, I think, up to 2012 maybe. And uh, and they um, took that data and they projected it backwards to the late 50s, which is the upper left panel, so that you see only the major cities on the northeastern coast are really affected by light pollution, but then by the middle of the 70s, um, the eastern half of the U.S. is is getting very light polluted until the mid or late 1990s. You see it's very, very, uh, a lot of impact on the eastern part, and then also Los Angeles, San Francisco, and San Diego, and then if you project that forward another, you know, 12 years or so, or 11 years now, my goodness, uh, the, the what we usually tell people is that the only place you'll be able to go to see a pristinely dark night sky when your children are having their children, basically, is the national parks, or are the national parks. Oh, so. That's rough. That stinks. <laughs> well, so I would maintain that it doesn't have to be the way it is shown there for 2025, that right. we still have an opportunity to make a, a serious difference with the problem of light pollution. and and. We have this confluence of things happening now. I mentioned that you know we've got new technology that allows us to control lights better than ever before, and uh, new styles of lighting. But I think our, our awareness is of the problems and the issues related to it are higher than ever before. And so we all can do something to make a difference, not just here in the U.S., but but globally, in making sure that people make the right choices for outdoor lighting. That people remember that there is a, such a thing as an off switch, <laughs> that lighting can be turned off when it's not needed. And that as we become more in tune with with these problems and realize that the solutions really are not very hard, if if, if we can just accept the fact that uh, some of us are afraid of the dark, and and we need a minimum level of light for them, but we need better light and less wasteful light, will make a huge difference in the problem overall. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we have a few more comments, uh, a lot of people talking about their experiences with uh, seeing dark skies, getting lost because they don't recognize the constellations when they're actually at a dark sky site. I am completely aware of that problem. It's um, a good one. That, yeah, it's a good problem to have. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I grew up in New York City. I finally saw the Milky Way a little bit when I was in Pennsylvania in high school and then in college in New Mexico, and I was just like, blah, blown away. Um, yeah. So I'm glad a lot of people here have that experience as well. It's a good problem to have, like you said. Uh, and I particularly like this comment from Michael Chobin. In conversations on this, it never fails that someone brings up what about light pollution filters. I go, <laughs> 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 um, Yeah, if you're, if you're doing imaging, uh, you know, we have a virtual star party astronomer, Gary Ganella, who does amazing imaging with light pollution filters and H-alpha filters from, like, L.A. <laughs> Super light polluted L.A. Um, but not everybody has the, the money for the filters and the telescope aperture to still be able to collect enough light, and, and you're not going to get those beautiful Milky Way night sky views like we showed at the beginning of, of That's the right. Hour. And with the style of light changing, uh, LEDs that are becoming more and more common are much more continual... Yeah. spectrum sources, whereas a high pressure sodium is, is emission, so you get a band of light in this color and a band in that color. The astrophotographers have been able to choose their wavelengths very carefully to say, oh, well, they're, they're not emitting light here, so I'm going to photograph this band and that band, and, and, and they can get these really cool photos. As we go to much more continuous wavelength lighting, like LED, that's going to be much harder for people. So. Yeah. Shielding, motion sensing, making sure that the lights are only as bright as they need to be and only on when they need to be, that they are low color temperature, that they're not really spiking in the blue because that makes the sky seriously 
brighter than other colors do. There are all kinds of things that can be done to, to help with, with the fact that the style of lighting is changing and, and to make the lighting a little better. Absolutely, and, and, and there's an interesting corollary happening in the radio spectrum. A lot of emissions I mean, <laughs> are moving from narrowband to broadband, and, and that's, cut. that's caused some problems for radio observatories as well. So. There's light pollution there too, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just the wrong wavelength for us to be able to see, yeah. and that makes it really hard for the radio folks because, you know, you and I, we can talk about light pollution and, and, say, and point out these examples, right? But it's really hard to do that, and, and there was a, um, a great demonstration. I remember somebody from, from Green Bank, uh, West Virginia, doing uh, an example with an old transistor radio and a battery-powered fan, and they turned on the fan, and they got static on the radio. So the fan was emitting in the, in the EM that they, you couldn't see, but the radio could pick it up. I've actually yeah. seen that with a particular little toy, like spinning LED toy, that they started selling in the gift shop at Green Bank until they realized oh, no. huge RFI source. So they oh, got rid of all those, uh, but they kept one around for demonstration purposes. And yeah, they do that. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Oopsie. Uh, <laughs> oh, the irony. Yeah. This, learn by doing, right? Yeah. Learn by doing. Learn by up and they have a job. Oh, wait. You know, I'm just gonna have a show on that. <laughs> We're gonna have a show on, on radio. <laughs> we'll stick cool. With, with light, but this is great. Um, there was, uh, oh gosh, I just missed it. There was a comment uh, from Nancy. Thanks, everyone. Another great show. Now we need to educate the general populace. So, yes. yes. Go out there, please, and everyone that watches, please help. Yeah, we, we, we need all of you to speak out about light pollution in whatever way you can. And if you have control over any lights of your own, remember, turn them off. Shield them. Do what you can. Yeah. And I know we don't have a lot of time, and but Connie, I know teachers are involved with this as well, and um, so education through um, teachers and young students to bring their awareness up and get this, get them involved in collecting data and improving the skies is really important too. And it's, I would say, it's a very teacher-friendly program and a very teacher-friendly website. Lots of good resources. Well, for thank you. So. Yeah, and we have another one. Oh, Activities too on the yeah, COVID nineteen. Exactly. Do those as well. Yeah. We're counting on the kids to educate their parents <laughs> to really well, fix this problem. And that's well, yeah, we, that can be the best way. Yeah. Yeah, the National Observatory has been particularly been targeting Yay. young children because, you know, let's face it, they're going to be our stewards of the earth tomorrow. And if they understand what the problems are today, they'll know how to fix them tomorrow. And oftentimes, like Scott says, they go home and they, they, they influence their parents mm -hmm. who in turn start asking questions and coming to those star parties and, right. and uh, you know, being inquisitive. And it's really wonderful. So the word has gotten out a lot <laughs> through the, the program with Globe at Night. And uh, I hope that many people will, will help and participate. It's very easy to do. Very easy to do. The resources page actually has a link right on it that says Globe at Night U.S. Educational Standards. So, well, bam! There you go. You guys list the next gen and the National Science Education Standards. All um, those good things. All those good things that relate to dark sky activities. So you can get your have a covered. Twitter, and we have a Facebook page. So if you'd like to sign up um, on on the Globe at Night webpage to get those things, please feel free. Um, we're very really happy to, to um, email them out to you. So. so the current campaign is uh, May 19th through the 28th. That's the current Globe at Night campaign. I was just out last night. There's no moon between 8 and 10. Uh, um, you can go outside in the northern hemisphere and see Leo straight overhead. Uh, so go and go and make those observations. Use your apps. Use your your devices, your tablets. <laughs> your eyes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, That's don't break your eyes. <laughs> about the moon because the moon is a natural light bulb in the night sky and we don't want to take a globe at night measurement <laughs> when the moon is out. So um, even though you, you, might be, you might be at higher latitudes and you won't, might not be able to go out until after the sun sets after 9 o'clock, feel free, you know, it, even if it's beyond 10 o'clock but the moon is not up, please feel free to contribute a measurement. Yeah, so. yeah, we want dark time. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm going to do a brief rundown of what's coming up on our uh, on our channel, and then we will sign off. Um, this.
Friday is the Weekly Space Hangout, uh, hosted by Fraser Kane. There will be a bunch of astronomy uh, reporters, journalists, and general dorks like me who write about things uh, to talk about the uh, the space news from this week. Uh, I will not be there. I will be in Baltimore at Balticon with Nancy Graziano and everybody else who's going. So if you will be at Balticon, uh, check our blog. We'll be putting up a schedule of the talks and, and panels that Pamela and I are doing. Plus, we'll have a table so you can come by, say hi, and play with CosmoQuest with us. Uh, so yay, Balticon. Uh, Friday's Weekly Space Hangout. Sunday, assuming they don't cancel, they've canceled every other week for, for just bad weather on the West Coast where most of their astronomers are. Sunday, it's a virtual star party. They will once again try and host it at 9 p.m. Pacific, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, uh, weather depending and people's schedules depending. Uh, so sorry about that. I know you guys are a disappoint, bit disappointed that about every other week's been canceled. Uh, but they'll be trying every Sunday night. Uh, and then Monday, I'm going to go ahead and assume that Astronomy Cast is going to be postponed because Pamela... And I will be on panels that day at Balticon. So stay tuned uh, to the Astronomy Cast page to see when their next show will be. That brings us around to next week's Learning Space, which is... No, I don't have the thing open. <laughs> I don't either. Wait, I do. That. We will be talking to Josh Rosenau from the National Center for Science Education. Uh, we got a qu specific question several weeks ago uh, asking what can teachers do when when pre when presented with uh, things like creationism from their students in the classroom how do you deal with to uh, difficult topics like that in the classroom so we will be talking specifically about that in response to that question uh, so tune in next week for that show um, that's it for this week uh, again go to dark sky it's dark sky dot dark sky dot org Yes. International Dark Sky or globeatnight.org. Do you guys have any last words of advice for our listeners? No. Every photon counts. Don't don't be afraid to do something that that makes a difference. Turning off one light, shielding one light, putting in a, a lower wattage bulb. Uh, it, you you can all do something that makes a difference. You can educate a neighbor, a friend, a, a city council person, and uh, make the world a better place. And there's power in numbers. Please participate in Globe at Night. And, um, and we hope to see you soon again. Awesome. Thank you so much, you guys. I'll see you next right. week. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Yeah. All right, bye-bye.